the uh, topic uh, that you gave me uh, was the um, role of civil society, uh, increasing role of civil society, peace building, and democratization. And I was thinking about how to understand that. Because it is very fashionable these days to talk about civil society and the role that it's playing. And we see the revolutions in the Arab world. Um, but I think the first thing to say is that civil society is not new. Um, it has been around as long as people have been around. And uh, if you even if you can think back to many historical examples uh, where civil society played pivotal roles at different times in history, even in our own revolution here, uh, it was not just legislators from the colonial um, uh, legislatures, but it was also bartenders and printers and um, lots of others who, who mobilized in order to create a network of activists who were demanding change. And that's, um, that, that was a catalyst here. If you think back to the Cold War, uh, our engagement was not limited to the governments of communist regimes in the East, but also to trying to identify and support activists like uh, Václav Havel or, or uh, Nakhvalesa or many others. So, and, and who were these people? These were shipyard workers or playwrights or uh, dramatists or musicians and all kinds of activists. So this is not a new phenomenon. Um, but nonetheless, you do have to conclude that something is different now. And what I would conclude is different is the relative power available to civil society compared to the relative power available to governments. Previously, you had to mobilize civil society, but then you were dependent upon financing and, and uh, military capacity and security resources, and you were always outmaneuvered by the overwhelming capacity of governments to control things if they wished to. Uh, through military power, through police power, through censorship, through access to information, to financial resources. Governments had the power to control an awful lot. Uh, I would argue that today, with the um, communications technology, uh, the, you know, portable handheld you know, communications technology, uh, with the relative cheap cost of access to these things, um, there's a lot more available to average people than was ever the case before. And now there's almost an advantage on the side of civil society because governments are hamstrung by decision-making processes, by uh, hierarchical layers of bureaucracy, uh, by uh, laws, legislation, regulations, uh, legal advice, uh, alternative political forces that will come into play. So uh, governments tend to actually be slow and heavy uh, when it comes to dealing with developments in the world now, while civil society is completely unencumbered. Because so what if you do something wrong? <laughs> you can just keep going. Uh, and, and that is what uh, you see uh, happening, is that lots and lots of groups with lots of capacity can, can mobilize. Um, this has... Um, been reflected then, I think, in the way that we understand the way governments uh, need to engage. First off, a, a, it is a great incentive for democracy, because if you do not grant in your own society the ability of your population to mobilize and pursue its own wishes and will, you know, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, uh, they will demand it. Uh, they, they will organize and start doing it anyway. A government that seeks to control that is then automatically in conflict with its population. And a democratic government, on the other hand, seeks to try to empower and regulate and ensure fairness in society, but not to prevent. Uh, and that, that is a great incentive for democracy through this empowering technology that is available to civil society. If you are then a democratic government, as the US is, or European nations are, or many, many others, seeking to engage in the world, it is not enough to engage with other governments because, um, especially in non-democratic societies, because you need to actually engage with the forces that are going to be shaping those countries. And that may be bar associations, it may be journalist associations, it may be student groups, it may be women's groups, maybe uh, children's health advocates, whoever it may be. There are, there are going to be groups in society organizing and pushing for 
their own interests and also change in that society. And you see that in the way that uh, I would give Hillary Clinton a lot of credit, the, the way that she has engaged in her foreign travel. Of course, she meets with her counterpart foreign ministers and other leaders in government, but she always takes time out to do events with civil society groups around the world to recognize the role that they're playing and to encourage them, uh, because they ultimately will be shaping more democratic countries that are going to be better for, the, for those societies as a whole. Uh, so recognizing that uh, is a tremendous um, importance of understanding the world that we're living in and then how to deal with that if you're in a policy-making position. Uh, there are a couple other things, and I'll just tick them off quickly because I, I, I'd rather get more into a discussion than just to continue talking, but when you think about the implications of this, uh, you have empowered small actors over large ones. You have empowered peaceful means of engagement and activity over violent means. Uh, you have put a priority on speed, where governments tend to be slow, people can be faster. Um, you have put a priority on ideas, because ideas are something that can be distributed, and people act on ideas and their beliefs, as opposed to control. Uh, so it's a distributed belief in ideas, whereas control requires a central authority to demand that something be done and done a certain way and monitored and supervised. If it's distributed, you can't possibly do that, and it's actually the ideas that drive uh, the results then, whether people genuinely believe in something and do it, or they don't, and it, it just disappears. Uh, it empowers uh, local activity rather than uh, more far-reaching. One of the interesting things about the Arab uh, revolutions going on now is they're all about local issues uh, of human rights and justice, not about Arab-Israeli process, not about Islam, not about the United States. It's all uh, self-driven. Um, and it has a, uh, the effect of diminishing the role of state governments. Uh, so there are examples of the super integration of governments into things like the European Union where you have a larger mass and you try to create some rules, but that is accompanied by a disintegration of power at a, at a state level uh, and really distributed to much lower levels. And I will pause there and look forward to comments.